right? May Allah Azza wa Jal keep us steadfast and upon that which is correct. Yeah. My brothers and my sisters, as you guys may have seen on the poster that went round, which I think had the incorrect time, right? Yeah. The topic today is about how we can soften up our hearts before the month of Ramadan. With Ramadan around the corner, my brothers and my sisters, a lot of the time what tends to happen is we want to do well in the month of Ramadan. However, we struggle to hit the ground running. And that is because we are not in gear. When you enter into a car, if you're driving a manual, not an automatic or a Tesla, right? When you're driving a manual, you have to go into gear one, two, three, and four before you are able to put your foot down, right? Ramadan is no different, brothers and sisters. We want to take maximum and optimum reward away from the month of Ramadan. However, because we're carrying so much baggage from outside the month of Ramadan, we barely are able to hit the ground running. And before you know it, already 10 days has gone past. 20 days has gone past. And then it's already eight. And then we're left disappointed, not having taken advantage of the greatest month of the year. This is why this topic that has been chosen of softening up your heart is extremely, extremely important. We're living in a time and age, my brothers and my sisters, where you have corruption at every direction you go in. We have filth and evil that is extremely, extremely rampant and widespread. Wherever you go, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he told us in multiple hadith how difficult times will be when we near the day of resurrection. We hear about the hadith, right? That speak about the end of times. The minor signs. And we also hear about the major signs. From that which the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prophesied over 1400 years ago, Salawat Rabbi wa Salamu Alayhi. When he said, من أشراط الساعة أن يقل العلم ويظهر الجهل ويظهر الزنا ويكثر الهرج from the signs of the hour is that knowledge becomes scarce it becomes less and less the more the more you draw closer to the end of times ignorance becomes so prevalent my brothers and my sisters just look on Twitter Right? It is the platform if you want to cancel someone, right? Forget about cancelling someone who's alive today. You have some individuals going after Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Out of all the people that they could try and cancel, they could try and antagonize and insult and go after, they are going after the likes of Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Who is Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala anhu, my brothers and my sisters? The companion that narrated the most a hadith. It wasn't Abu Bakr, it wasn't Umar, it wasn't Uthman, it wasn't Ali. The four great caliphites who took charge after the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away. There was that companion who went through a lot of trouble, who experienced a lot of poverty and hardship. The companion, my brothers and my sisters, who would tie his stomach with a stone. Imagine this brothers and sisters, he would take a stone and then he would tie it against his stomach after the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam instructed him to do so. Why? Because he wanted to seek knowledge from the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. While there were other companions who were busy with their wealth, they were busy with their businesses. The likes of Abu Hurairah would sit in the house of Allah Azza wa Jal and he would tie his stomach because of how hungry he would become. He would go to see hungry guys. He narrated the most a hadith. As Hafid al Suyuti rahmatullahi alayhi mentions in his thousand line poem. Wal muqthiruna fi riwayat al athar. Abu Hurairah ibn Umar. Abu Hurairah was number one, and then Abdullah ibn Umar was number two. You have individuals who barely know anything about their religion going after the likes of Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala anhu because he was the narrator of some ahadith that concerns women. You got the feminists coming after him. Right? 
These individuals who barely know anything about their religion. They may be running to university students. This system, my brothers and my sisters, and excuse me for mentioning the feminists. We've been having a great time on Twitter recently, right? These feminists who barely know anything about the religion, right? Some of them, my brothers and my sisters, they started university. And I'm going to speak a little bit about university and highlight how this is impacting our hearts, my brothers and my sisters. Right? She starts university dressing modestly, adhering to Islamic values and morals. After entering into this university, my beloved brothers and sisters, she runs into certain individuals who have polluted minds. And these individuals, subhanAllah, may not necessarily look any different to her. But because their minds have been hijacked, their brains have been polluted, they start spewing all types of filth and garbage. Not realizing that some of the things that are coming out of their mouth is borderline Islam. It's flirting, flirting with kufr. Wallahi al-Azim, my brothers and my sisters, a lot of us think that the greatest sin that we might be able to fall into in today's day and age is atheism. Yes, without a shadow of a doubt. That's something that strips you of your faith. However, there are other sentiments, there are other isms where one begins to embrace certain filth and evil, certain sentiments that causes him now to flirt with kufr. And without even realizing, she subconsciously embraces some of these doubts that have been thrown her way, goes to the Quran and starts questioning, right? Some of the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it doesn't stop there. She starts contesting it. Speaking to Allah Azza wa Jalla in a boisterous manner. How is this even fair? Look what the Qur'an is saying. Look what the Qur'an says about this and says about that. Talking about the Qur'an as if it's a human being. Let's change the words up a little bit and say, what does Allah Azza wa say about this, right? Sometimes, the way some of the questions are posed is of the following. What does Islam say about abortion? What does Islam say about women? What does Islam say about certain roles? About the woman becoming this and a woman becoming that? Or a man doing this or a man doing that? Why is it that we are wording it like this? What does Islam say? No, say what does Allah say? Can you see how the dynamics change, my brothers and my sisters? These universities, my brothers and my and I say this as someone who went to university and studied civil engineering. It is a breeding ground for kufr, shirk, all of these different isms, and of course, the rainbow team, right? <laughs> It's the breeding ground for all of these things. And I just want to make something very, very clear, just in case we have Fox News in the crowd, right? I am not here to incite violence or harassment towards any human being. I'm not here to express my own views and opinions. I just quote. That's why none of my videos on YouTube get taken down, even though they're extremely controversial, because we have disclaimers right in the beginning, right? I am not here to do any of that. We're just here to spread peace and to enlighten the Muslims of what is mentioned in the Quran and likewise the Sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is a breeding ground for shirk, for kufr, for all types of filth, you name it, fahisha. Everything is calling you now to go and contest what Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala came with. I just finished in the UK a university tour where I went past 27 universities. Right? And some of these blue haired feminists, right? They tried to close some of my programs. They tried to shut it down. But alhamdulillah, they failed. And likewise, those who are extremely colorful, right? They tried their utmost best, but it didn't work. Do you know how many students came up to me after I would deliver a lecture discussing some of these doubts that they are maybe going through and said, I think we may have to change some of the subjects that we are studying. I would speak a lot about philosophy class. No offense to anybody who studied philosophy, guys. But we have to be real here. That professor does not care as to whether you're a Jew 
Christian, a Muslim. Any person of religiosity, he is coming after him. Am I wrong, brothers and sisters? Aren't there professors like that in university campus? They don't care what religion you are following. Right? They will try to strip you of your faith. That's what they're there to do, brothers and sisters. So I'm not wrong if I said that these universities are breeding grounds for kufr and shirk and all types of evil. Not so long ago I received a phone call. Or was it maybe it was an email? I think no, it was an email. Of a brother who was complaining about his mother. He was saying that his mother came to know that her daughter has apostate, has become an atheist. She's come to know that. However, she does not want to do anything about it. You know why? Because she doesn't want to rock the boat. Her child is focused on myth studies or myth school, whatever you guys call it. And because she's focused and concentrating on her studies, she doesn't want to open the discussion about Islam. Does God exist or not? Right? Our studies, my brothers and my sisters, at the expense of Islam, that which is most precious to us, at Tawheed, has it reached that point, brothers and sisters, that Al Islam has now become secondary to every single one of us? Is that what's happened now, my brothers and my sisters? Ignorance has reached this point. Does the hadith make a lot of sense now, my brothers and my sisters? From the signs of the hour is what? That ilm becomes scarce. Ignorance becomes so widespread. Right? And the reality of the matter is, my brothers and my sisters, right, we really, really shouldn't be surprised that all of this is happening and unfolding right before our eyes. You know why? Because we don't want to do anything about it. What do I mean by that? Many people always ask, right, how can we deal with a lot of these isms, these social problems that we're having? Our children being swiped from under our noses. What can we do? A lot of us are sitting around feeling sorry for ourselves. Right? Many of us are sick and tired of seeing this. I'll give you guys the example of the rainbow team. Well, I brother says I'm being serious. And it's unfortunate that I have to use them as an example. You know, Ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullahi alayhi said the following. And whenever I see their efforts, I remember the statement of Ibn Taymiyyah that was uttered over 700 years ago. He says, وَكُلَّمَا ضَعُفَ مَنْ يَقُومُ بِنُورِ النُّبُوَةِ Right? The more you see people who call to the truth becoming less and less and less, enlightening the people about Allah's Qur'an and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Sunnah, Fashat al fujur You will see wickedness and evil, right? Al bida innovations, and all types of filth, my brothers and my sisters, becoming rampant and widespread. This is why when you have an extreme, right, you will see the opposite as a knee jerk reaction, right? You see one extreme taking a stronghold on the community. One begins to feel, or he's made to feel, and that's very, very important. I word it like that. Right? We had extremism, widespread in certain parts of the world. Right? Joining terrorist groups and so on and so forth. And of course, this is something that we condemn. With our mouths that are full, we condemn terrorism in every possible way. Then you are made to feel that you need to leave Right, your Islamic values and morals in order to be a balanced Muslim. Does that make sense, my brothers and my sisters? But why does that have to be the case though? Right? Ibn al-Tayyim he mentions, right? Shaitan doesn't care. Deenullah wasat, right? The religion of Islam is a balanced religion. However, the shaitan comes to you, right? And he tries to either take you right wing or left wing. He does not care whether you're right wing or you're left wing. His biggest objective is that you move away from normative Islam. 
to be a balanced Muslim. Right? This is why you got the liberals coming out portraying a flavor of an Islam which is absolutely batil. And the feminists are used as puppets to spread all types of filth, to spew all types of nonsense. Right? And you find the hub for this in the universities. When I've done this tour, my brothers and my sisters, I've spoken to enough people who are on the fringes of their religion, unfortunately. They are being targeted. As someone went to university, you know what I witnessed, brothers and sisters? People like me and you, people like me and you, learning my religion, so that you can become guided. لِيَحْتَدُونَ <laughs> هَوَ Just so they could target vulnerable Muslims who are uneducated. And they start destroying their hearts. Right? Let me make something very, very clear. And I'm hoping every single one of you guys writes this down. Because you're going to need it. Especially when you see someone that you know. Or someone that knows the person that you know. All of a sudden now, having doubts about his religion. Just because you don't have the answers, my brothers and my sisters, that does not mean there aren't any answers. I'll say that again. Just because you don't have any answers, that doesn't mean there aren't any answers. Does that make sense? As someone who's maybe what, second year med student, if you go back in the summer holidays, right, maybe back to Pakistan or Somalia, people will start asking you questions about medicine. You're not going to have the answers for everything. You're going to turn around to that person and say, listen, I think I'm just a second year med student, right? I'm still learning. It's common sense, huh, to react in that way. You're not qualified. Would anyone in their right mind, my brothers and my sisters, leave med school just because he didn't know the answer to the question he was asked back home in Somalia? Would anyone in their right mind do that? Then why is it when some doubts are posed to you, you are someone who's uneducated, right? You are not equipped with the tools to repel these doubts that are coming your way. Why is it that you are shaken by it? Or it's easy for you to just maybe leave the religion of Islam. Just because you don't have the answers, that doesn't mean there aren't any answers. We ask the people that are more knowledgeable than us. This is bound to happen, my brothers and my sisters, in today's day and age. The Messenger told us this. How quickly people will leave the fold of Islam. In the hadith that always terrifies me, my brothers and my sisters, it scares the living day out of me whenever I come past it. He, salawatu rabbi wa salamu alayhi, said, Say salawatu alayhi wa salam, guys. Why are you guys quiet? Allah hitinkum. Ameen. The Messenger, salawatu alayhi wa salam, said, Badiru bil a'mal fitanan ka qita al layl al Hasten to doing good deeds. The fitan. The corruptions that you will find at the end of time is the trials and tribulations. They are like the dark patches of the night. Imagine yourself now, my brothers and my sisters, in the middle of a dark forest. There aren't any torches, there isn't any light. You will see yourself tripping over left, right and center, Sahih. Because you don't have the light that is going to guide you out of this forest. Look what the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. يُصْبِحُ الْإِنسَانُ مُؤْمِنًا وَيُمْسِي كَافِرًا When he wakes up in the morning as a Muslim, as a believer, وَيُمْسِي كَافِرًا And by the night, my brothers and my sisters, he has apostated. Right? So quickly he ends up leaving the fold of Islam. This is not Abu Taymiyyah bringing out a narration from his own back pocket, brothers and sisters. The Prophet ﷺ told us this over 1400 years ago. وَيُمْسِي الْإِنسَانُ مُؤْمِنًا وَيُصْبِحُ كَافِرًا He then goes on to say the opposite. It may well be that he enters into the night, he's a believer. But then by the morning he has disbelieved. يَبِيعُ دِينَهُ بِعَرَضِ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا Right? I used to look at this hadith maybe over 10 years ago and think to myself, how does that happen? He enters into the night, a believer. That's a time when one is normally tired. And then goes to sleep, right? And then by the morning he's become a disbeliever. How does that happen? Right? 
Ah, this was all before social media, guys. When these smartphones came into our lives, life completely changed, brothers and sisters. I remember one of our professors, and I came across this book of his when I was revising for the master's entry exam in Medina University. This Shaykh, Shaykh Abdul Qadir Ata, he speaks about how they used to instruct the teachers at the university not to expose the students that come over with doubts that they would probably never run into. If a student now has come from Pakistan or has come from Somalia, only deal with the doubts that they are asking you about. Don't expose them to doubts that they will probably never ever come across. Well, I said this. Right? Because everyone lives in different places around the world. What you're exposed to is very limited. However, he says, as for now, in today's day and age, the whole world has become like a small little village. Agreed, guys? Huh? Once upon a time, if you wanted to access that which is haram, right? Or you wanted to access one of these links, huh? that speak about how Islam is not the truth and whatever have you, you would have to go to that big Dell computer with a big back that is sitting inside of your living room. While you're on it, accessing haram, you're watching the door. Is anybody coming or not? Sahih? Nobody in their right mind would take that big Dell computer with the big back down to his bedroom, right? Under his blanket. Would anybody do that? Nobody would do that. However, life has become extremely easy now, brothers and sisters. We have these gadgets, these smartphones, huh? that we go to sleep with, right? And then when you wake up, instead of saying, Alhamdulillah, he's like this, checking where his phone is. Agreed? Let's be honest, guys. Let's stop being in denial. Where well, you can access all types of filth and evil just before you go to sleep, right? The World Wide Web is a fingertip away. Sahih. For those who don't know what WWW stands for, it stands for the World Wide Web. Let that resonate for a moment. The whole world is a fingertip away. Haram will come to your doorstep. You just need to click a couple of buttons. Right? Apostasy has become so rampant and easy to access. Right? With the spread of social media, of course, right? So the reality of the matter, my brothers and my sisters, wherever you look, you're either dealing with fitna to shubuhat, the fitna of doubts, or the fitna of what? Shahwat, temptations. This is why when we go back to the first hadith that I was mentioning, من الشراط السعن يقل العلم ويظهر الجهل ويظهر الزنا also, zina, my brothers and my sisters, becomes what? Prevalent and widespread. All of that which I'm speaking about, my brothers and my sisters, it is going to destroy your heart. I want you to really think with me for a moment. Why is it, my brothers and my sisters, there are periods in the day that we feel pretty positively, right? Our morale is up. Our morale is up. We feel good about ourselves. But then all of a sudden that drops. Right? We feel down. Right? We're going to come on to that, inshaAllah ta'ala. Look what he's saying here. Zina. zina becomes extremely prevalent and widespread. Once upon a time, my brothers and my sisters, I remember, some of you guys may and may not, if a sister became impregnated outside of marriage, it would be a big deal. Did you guys live at that time? Maybe not, because you're all millennials, right? Huh? Huh? Gen C? Huh? What's that mean? Is there something else in the middle of that? Are you, are you brother and sister with me? Once upon a time, if a sister became impregnated outside of marriage, it would be a big deal, guys. It would be a really, really big deal. Right? However, now, sister becomes impregnated outside of marriage, the parent tries to find excuses for himself. Wallahi, that family, you know, that sister died in that family, and that done it. 
شي ضنات لاينوس ويظهر الزنا A lot of time we think, right? Zina of what? When the man and the woman they get together, sahih? There's another type of zina as well, I'll tell you guys about it. Zina al aynayn Huh? Zina al aynayn al The zina of the eyes is what? Looking. The zina of the lisan is what? Flirting and chirping with her. Right? Wazina al-yat al The zina of the hands is to reach out to her and the zina of the feet is to go and walk towards her. When you look at the first two, my brothers and my sisters, right? How easy has it become? How easy has it become now to do zina with your eyes and also zina with your tongue? With the spread of social media, guys. Huh? Sometimes a sister de- uh, slips into your DMs, right? And the shaitan is whispering. Huh? Don't give a da'wah. No. Right? <laughs> huh? You make a hundred and one excuses for yourself. Well, I, she might become my future wife. Huh? And before you know it, my brothers and my sisters, huh? her body ends up giving him da'wah. <laughs> In the month of Ramadan, my brothers and my sisters, with the month of Ramadan, round the corner. With the Ramadan on the corner. Just about every Ramadan, my brothers and my sisters, I receive a message, maybe a couple, right, of a brother and a sister asking, What is the expiation for having committed a zina? What is the expiation for having committed a zina in the month of Ramadan? Did you know, my brothers and my sisters? If you are married, husband and wife, husband and wife, if they have sexual intercourse while fasting in the month of Ramadan, right? Did you know, my brothers and my sisters, they are committing the worst and most major of sins? Did you guys know that? Between husband and wife, we're not talking about boyfriend and girlfriend. Husband and wife, it is a major sin. A man came to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said, Ya Rasulullah, وَقَعْتُ عَلَى مْرَأَتِي I had sexual intercourse with my wife. Right? And he also said, هَلَكْتُ وَفِي رِوَائِدٍ احْتَرَقْتُ He said, I've destroyed myself. In another narration, he said, I've burnt myself, meaning I've burnt myself in the hellfire. This is between husband and wife. So now they're asking, I committed a zina in the month of Ramadan. And you're wondering to yourself, how on earth did the guy do this? Or did she do this in the month of Ramadan? Ah, who can answer? Instagram, aka Fitnagram, guys. I, sometimes it starts with an innocent look. And the moment you click on a profile picture, my brothers and my sisters, and vice versa, uh, you are playing with fire. One thing leads to another. Even in the month of Ramadan, right? We tend to just kill time. The hunger kicks in, especially an hour or two before iftar. And you're just what? Scrolling and roaming the internet. Zina al Huh? The zina of the eye is what? Looking. And then the zina of the tongue is what? The flirting. Speaking with her. Right? As much as you try to make excuses for yourself, my brothers and my sisters, and I'm going to tell the brothers this especially. Huh? The fact that you think, the fact that you think, huh? that you have the strength to protect yourself from women, right? It shows how much you have become deluded. Let's be honest with ourselves. Sometimes we go to one of these universities and say, We got good intentions, can men and women just be friends? Huh? Can men and women just be friends? We got good intentions. Nothing big is going to come out of it. That's how it all starts, right? Huh? This is how the shaitan operates, my brothers and my sisters. He's not going to say to you, this is haram, go and do it. He's going to try and beautify it for you as much as he can. Just like he did with who? 
Our father Adam and Eve. And by the way, not Adam and Steve, guys, huh? From Adam and Eve. Just in case somebody is saying that this is natural. Huh? It was Adam and Eve. He purified it for them. وَقَاسَمَهُمَا إِنِّي لَكُمَا لَمِنَ النَّاصِحِينَ He swore by Allah to Qasam. I am indeed a sincere advisor to you. Eat from the tree and you will be from the Khali Deen. You will become from those who spent forever and ever in a Jannah, in paradise. Right? I'm going to tell you guys about a relative of mine who fell into this trap. Because it's Ramadan related as well, right? We all want to... Huh? This brother, at the beginning of Ramadan, my brothers and sisters said, Khalas, I'm cutting off my girlfriend. He's also a drug dealer, by the way, guys. Why are you guys laughing? He said, Khalas, they cut her off. This Ramadan, I'm going to change. There are many Muslims, my brothers and my sisters, they use the month of Ramadan as a stepping stone. Sahih? For you to start referring as their sister as a Ramadan Muslim, or the guy who started practicing in the month of Ramadan as a Ramadan Muslim, you are gravely mistaken. Fear Allah. Right? There are two kinds of people. Someone who says, you know what? Ramadan, I'm going to stop, but then on Eid, can't wait for it. Huh? <laughs> In the final 10 nights of Ramadan, he's preparing which girl he's going to meet, which hotel he's going to sleep in, and what car he's going to be driving. Sahih. However, there are others, like the first that I just spoke about. Kept up. We can hear you. That's just from outside of says. We got sister standing outside listening. <laughs> طيب. There are Muslims who use the month of Ramadan as a stepping stone to get better. That's when they start practicing. For you to look down on them, you are gravely mistaken. So this is what he tried to do. He stopped selling drugs and he cut off that girl who he was doing haram with. We fast in the day and we pray in the night, right? That's exactly what this drug dealer is doing. You know, sometimes you ask, why is it I don't feel the same outside the month of Ramadan? When I was in the month of Ramadan, why? Simply because we do a lot of righteous deeds, guys. This really increases our iman. Come the day of Eid, he gets a phone call. He gets a phone call from the sister. But look how the shaitan operates. Like I told you guys, he's very, very subtle. Huh? He's not going to say to you this haram. He'll try and beautify it for you. Right. He gets the phone call from the sister. And she says to him, Can you come over to the house? I want to speak to you about making it halal. I want to speak to you about making it halal. You know what he said to me? He drove down, parked up. Within a couple of minutes, they committed sin in the back of the car. I'm not finished yet, brothers and sisters. I'm not finished. I'm not finished. We sat down in the park together, right? And he burst down into tears. He said, all of the hard work in the month of Ramadan when my iman was sky high, it is as if it came crumbling down that very moment. Remind me of the hadith, right? And remember guys, this is a drug to say this. Messenger Salah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying, لا يزني الزاني حين يزني وهو مؤمن Right? When one commits a zina, Iman is taken away from him. His faith, right, is taken away from him. Does that, be, does that mean he becomes a non-Muslim? No. It is uplifted from him. There are certain bad deeds that we fall into, my brothers and my sisters, that affect our Iman, and it gradually causes it to go down, 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 and down. Up until there's nothing left, and then we are left empty, broken, miserable, right? Spiritually dead, guys. And there are certain acts like a zina, even if your iman huh, is sky high, up in cloud nine, 
It will come crashing down. Are you promised this to be me? This is what sins do to an individual. A lot of times we think, I, if I carry out the sin, if I fall into this haram, the only time I have to deal with it is when I meet Allah on Yom Al-Qiyamah. You're mistaken, my friend. The consequences are almost instant, immediate. He says, I feel like I've lost my Ramadan. I was in such a better place spiritually. And I know a lot of us, right, feel like this. Many people, my brothers and sisters, let me tell you this, right? They are compressed. And they are empty. They're down, right? So you know what they do? They stay on their phone all day long. To distract their minds from what? From the underlying issues that they are suffering from. They look for something to distract their minds with. I, however, the heart doesn't work like that, guys. When I went to Virginia, I spoke a little bit about the YouTubers. I, some of you guys may have heard me mention this in the past in one of the videos. Guys like Logan Paul, huh? KSI, Justin Bieber, Mr. Beast. What's the other guy called? Fuzzy Tree. Huh? Huh? No, I didn't hear Slim Savers. Alright? Shaykh bin Kalam, my brothers and my sisters. I have all of these names that I just dropped. Saying almost that which is identical to the other. Hey, thank you guys. What do they all have in common? They got money. They got fame. They have cars. They have women. They have all that which you can think of. That many youngsters today would love to have. However, they also have something else in common. And that is, they are spiritually dead and empty. Is Abu Taymiyyah bringing this out in one back pocket? No, my brothers and my sisters. There's a brother who compiled small little clips of these YouTubers all saying the exact same thing. I remember sending it to my little brother. I was like, Ryan, what do you think? He was like, wow, man. Huh? They're living double lives. Because some of them were saying, what you see in front of the camera is very different, very different to what happens behind closed doors. They themselves are admitting this, guys. But they are all what spiritually dead in it. The way Allah Azza wa has created our hearts, my brothers and my sisters, right? It craves for its creator. Understand that, guys. Your heart, it craves for its creator. It is as simple as that. And the only thing that is going to give you that spiritual contentment and that ease and peace, brothers and sisters, if you have that relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And are you always putting first? I have 15 points written down here, guys, which I wanted to go through. However, I got a little bit carried away huh? from the things that soften your heart. You know what number one is, brothers and sisters? To put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. Right? Before every other human being. By way of doing righteous deeds. Right? Sometimes you find yourself in that predicament. Your friends are calling you to haram. Let's go and do this. This is going to bring us excitement huh? and satisfaction. Sahih. But then on the other hand, you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you, right? Muhammad, don't do this. We find in the Quran, Ya ya amin, Ya ya amin, Ya ya amin. Who is he speaking to, guys? What does Ya ya amin mean? Oh, you who believe. When we hear this, we should take it personally. Am I not someone who believes? We take that personally, brothers and sisters. Allah Azza wa Jal is calling me out. Sometimes we think, oh, he's speaking about my friends, he's not speaking about me when the khatib is giving a khutbah. That's personal, guys. Would you say to your mother, mom, wait for me, let me go finish playing game with my friend, and I don't want to come back to you? No one would disrespect their parents like the old day. What does it happen, guys? Even if we did, we know this is disrespectful. 
This in essence, my brothers and my sisters, is how we are conducting ourselves towards Allah Azza wa Jalla. Look at it like that. The Almighty Creator that we are leaving on standby. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allah is the greatest, Allah is the greatest. And we're sitting in front of the PS2. Not PS5, uh, sorry. Uh, PS2 is gone. Uh, or we're sitting in front of that football game or the NFL game or that basketball game. When I get time, I'm going to go to Allah Azza wa Jal. Right? This is what he's become brothers and sisters. Right? Little do we realize, my brothers and my sisters, only a matter of time. It's only a matter of time. Right? Before we are hurt, before we are hurt by that which we prioritize over Allah Azza wa Jal. It is as simple as that. You know how many DMs I get on a regular basis from sisters saying, Brother, please advise me, I'm heartbroken. He made me all of these promises, right? And then he dumped me, right? He said he was going to do this and he was going to do that. And now he played around with me and I feel absolutely broken. Ibn Taymiyyah over 700 years ago, you know what he said? أَنَّ كُلَّ مَنْ أَحَبَّ شَيْئًا لِغَيْرِ اللَّهِ فَلَا بُدَّ أَنْ يَطُرُهُ مَحْبُوبًا He said, make sure you know Anyone who loves other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? More than he should love the Allah Azza wa Jal. It's only a matter of time before you are left hurt by it. Makes a lot of sense now, right? All of these promises that he makes to you, my sister, which then all of a sudden leaves you disappointed and broken and miserable. Simply because we did not put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. When he told you, وَلَا تَقْرَبُ zina, Don't come close to a zina. Right? He didn't say, don't do this. He said, don't come close to it. And just to point out to my sisters, any guy who doesn't go straight to your father, this guy is not serious. The serious guy is not going to creep through the window. He's going to go straight through the door. And the fact that he caught you so easily, Right? He can let you go so easily as well. Remember that. Huh? All of these lies, these fake promises, we're going to be together forever. Huh? Wallahi, even drug dealers that I speak to, on a regular basis, they'll say, I've got these girlfriends, but you know, she's not like wife material. She's not wife material. That's how he talks. Right? She came to me so easily, she might, she might go to some other guy tomorrow so easily as well. Right? I don't want somebody like her as my wife. Somebody so loose like that. So you're bound to be hurt, my brothers and my sisters, in whatever capacity it might be. You are prioritizing your friends over Allah Azza wa Jal. They're going to do haram and you go with them when you know you shouldn't. It's only a matter of time. I have a principle in life. You know what this principle is? When nasu that ta'awun wa ala ithmi wa al-udwani abghada ba'adu ba'adu maqal ibn Taymiyyah. When the people they cooperate in sin and evil, it's only a matter of time before they bash heads with one another. Before they fall out with one another. Right? It is as simple as that. My brothers and my sisters, I want to talk to you guys about the two types of clothing that is mentioned in the Quran. Just to show you how an individual may become unrecognizable. I got people messaging me all the time saying, I got people messaging me all the time saying, I can't recognize myself anymore. My friends can't recognize me anymore. I was that pious Muhammad, all of a sudden I've become this monster. Lost control of my body parts, of my private parts. How do I go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? All the time I receive messages like this. Live down in me. I thought he said 39 seconds left. I thought he was giving me a countdown. <laughs> Are you brothers and sisters with me? 
In Surah Al-A'raf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the downfall of our father Adam alayhi salatu wasalam. And we are taught about two types of clothing. Allah says in the Quran, Ya Bani Adam, قَدْ أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكُمْ لِبَاسًا يُوَارِي سَوْآتِكُمْ وَرِيشًا وَلِبَاسُ التَّقْوَى ذَلِكَ خَيْرًا Right? Allah Azza wa Jalla said, we have sent down clothes for you to wear, to cover your private parts. <coughs> right? And then also Allah then tells us that there is a type of clothing, which is the clothing of taqwa. And Allah tells us that is better. Right? Let me now show you guys the connection. You have the physical type of clothing that you wear, to cover your aura, right? And then you have the type of clothing called the taqwa. But that doesn't make sense though, right? Taqwa, where is it? It's inside of the heart. Being conscious of Allah, having that fear. Is that the action of the limb or action of the heart? It's the action of the heart. Is it something that you can wear? Libas al taqwa. Here Allah Azza wa is referring to a taqwa as a type of clothing. Let me tell you guys about this scenario. Everyone here, there was once upon a time, and it may still be the case, where they were extremely shy. Sometimes we speak about shyness, and brothers think that this is only specific for sisters. No, it's a trait that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Prophets used to adorn and beautify themselves with. You were shy, right? You will hesitate before you speak to the other the gentle side. Shakes laughing, huh? Uh, you will hesitate, right? Before you speak to the opposite agenda, you weren't that comfortable around them. However, you were in that environment where the people used to gender mix. Huh? And the more you gender mix, the more you find yourself in that kind of environment the more comfortable you will get with the opposite and the Are you brothers and sisters with me? Pay attention to what I'm about to say. The more comfortable you become with the opposite gender, the more you will see your shyness diminishing. You're disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my brothers and my sisters, and that taqwa inside of your heart will get less and more and more less as time goes on. Right? And when that happens, my brothers and my sisters, that clothing of a taqwa, libas al taqwa, it diminishes as time goes on. What eventually happens, my brothers and my sisters? The physical clothing that one wears also will end up coming off and becoming less and less and less. Does that make sense? That which is going to destroy your taqwa is none other than the sins that we engage in. The more you do so, and especially when you're around the opposite agenda, eh, one thing leads to another, right? Innocent chit chats all of a sudden become haram chit chats, right? And before you know it, the clothes are coming off, both for male and female. Can you see the relation, my brothers and my sisters? Right? Your heart became destroyed, and then the limbs eventually followed. ألا وإن في الجسد مضغة إذا صلحت صلح الجسد كله وإذا فسد فسد الجسد كله ألا وهي القلب. Famous hadith that Allah has heard of. Huh? Not so long ago. It's been like uh, for the first time in a long time, right? Since I heard somebody say this. brother mentioned that the Iman is in the heart. Faith is in the heart. As long as you've got good intentions, no problem. Huh? He was trying to get one of his relatives to sit around with men. And she was like, no. Huh? It's like, this is good. Huh? As long as this is good. And then he asked me. I said, of course, look. Right? The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he said إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَنْظُرُ إِلَىٰ ثُوَرِكُمْ وَلَا إِلَىٰ إِسَادِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ يَنْظُرُ إِلَىٰ قُرُوبِكُمْ وَإِلَىٰ أَعْمَالِكُمْ Allah does not look at your outer appearance. He does 
Allah does not care about how big or how skinny or how black or how white you are. That's not something that Allah focuses on. Allah looks at your hearts. And there's also a second thing that was mentioned. That was, He also looks at your actions. Does that make sense for brothers and sisters? If that becomes corrupt, you will see the limbs following suit. Messenger Allah was saying, indeed, inside of your body, there is a piece of flesh. If that becomes corrupt, everything else becomes corrupt as well. It will just follow suit. And then it makes sense, right? Why all of a sudden you are unrecognizable to your people. To those who once upon a time praised you and complimented you. Right? Does that make sense, my brothers and sisters? There's a lot of things beginning to make sense as to why we may feel spiritually dead and empty. Why we may become unrecognizable. It all starts with what? A small little sin that we might not necessarily repent from. And eventually it leads to one apostate. I didn't say this, Ibn Qayyim did. He says, al baritul kufr. The sin that you fall into, it is the first part to disbelief. The first part to disbelief, brothers and sisters. If you're not repenting from it, immediately after carrying out that sin, right? One thing is going to lead to another. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Can everybody hear me? Wa alaikum assalam. Um, shortly, inshallah, the Shaykh is going to complete what he was saying. He's going to complete the rest of his lecture, inshallah. We're not cutting you off the word. Um, just wanted to make a quick announcement. Uh, for the people, there will be a portion of uh, question and answer. If you look at these two TV screens, you see a QR code. If you scan that QR code into your phone, inshallah, that will allow you to access the link with which you can ask the questions. As far as the people who can't see it or aren't close enough to it, we printed some papers with the QR code, inshallah, and if we pass around during the lecture, as the shaykh finishes up, Jazakumullah khair, as alaykum. Alaykum My brothers and my sisters, I want to conclude the lecture. I want to conclude the lecture with these five points. But before I do that, I want to read out this very, very powerful statement. May Allah Azza wa Jalla reward you guys for your patience. Uh, it's getting hot today, right? Huh? May Allah reward you guys for it. But remember, guys, the hellfire is more hotter. Huh? Now, in Jahannam, I said the Haram no carry it for. Sometimes these Fasiqat and Fajrat, they come to our Muslim sisters and they say, Isn't it hard in there, you know? While they're wearing the hijab, Sahih, say to them, Kul nahu jahannam ashaddu haram lo kami yathfahun. Fal yathaku qaleelan wal yathaku kathira. Huh? Laugh! Right? Laugh! Who's going to have the last laugh on Yom Al-Qiyamah? The believers. They can mock us, they can laugh at us as much as they want. Right? As much as they want. Inni jazaytuhum al yawma bima sabaru. Allah says, I will reward them today due to their patience. They are today the fa'izun, the successful ones. Be very patient. Alright, we're nearly, nearly done guys. Yeah? Put your hand up please if you came from Michigan. Allahu Akbar. Are you guys from Yemeni? Oh, yeah. Huh? <laughs> Anyone here from Atlanta? <laughs> Indiana? No, Kentucky. 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 It's close to me. Are you drove down? Indiana. I was there yesterday. Alright, let's put it in. He's from Africa. I said I'm going to mention five points, guys, that will help me, inshallah ta'ala, remain steadfast. But before I do that, I want you guys to quickly just think about the statement right? of Malik ibn Dinar, rahmatullahi alayhi. If you didn't take anything away from this lecture, 
Then please don't leave this off. Malik ibn Dinar rahmatullahi alayhi said, إِذَا رَأَيْتَ قَسَاوَةٍ فِي قَلْبِكَ وَوَهَنًا فِي بَدْنِكَ وَحِرْمَانًا فِي رِزْقِكَ فَعْلَمْ أَنَّكَ تَكَلَّمْتَ فِي مَا لَا يَعْلِيكَ If you begin to feel a hardness in your heart and a weakness in your body, because sometimes after sinning you feel that kind of weakness, right? Even though you had three meals that day, you had three meals, you had enough nutrition, enough water, but you're still feeling weak. And you begin to feel that your risk. Your provision is slow in coming towards you. You're being deprived from it. Nothing seems to be happening for you. Look what he says, guys. فَعْلَمْ أَنَّكَ تَكَلَّمْتَ فِي مَا لَا يَعْلِيكَ Then know you have spoken about that which does not consent. All of this is going to happen if you engage in that which doesn't consent. Right? When you look at this, this pleasing act to Allah Azza wa Jal. Is it the same as flirting with the opposite gender? Is it the same as backbiting? Is it the same as maybe abusing another individual whether it is done verbally or physically? Is it the same guys? No it's not. Because the sins are tabaqah, there are different levels. But all of this is going to happen when you do that. Allah, that's so powerful man. It really really is. Right? Second statement that I want to mention, and this is even more powerful. Ibn al-Jawzi rahmatullahi says, I believe it's in his kitab, Bahru al-Dumu'a. إِذَا غَلِقَ الْقَلْبُ فِي الْمُبَاحِ أَضْلًا فَكَيْفَ بِالْحَرَامِ If your heart now begins to drown in that which is permissible, your heart will start becoming dark. Let me ask you guys a question. Playing basketball is haram? Huh? You know what you guys want to know? It's so funny. Huh? I was in Philly, right? And I was on my way to New Jersey. The Sheikh received a message saying, people are warning against Abu Taymiyyah's program. Why are they warning against it? Because Abu Taymiyyah says, sports are haram. I told the Sheikh, send him this video and I'm going to send you where I'm not making somebody in and out. Huh? Because I was a bit of a baller myself, guys. Right? I can shoot three hoops, guys. Why is it three pointers? Is that what they call it? Huh? Even on the football pitch, guys. Have you guys heard of West Ham United? I transferred them back in the day. But I'm officially retired now. Huh? That's why they're doing really bad at it. Huh? Huh? They said they always suck. Huh? <laughs> You guys watch the Premier League? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so good. So good. <laughs> well, I said, Allah, the Muslims in New York, they really touched my heart. You know why? I walked past the Barclays Center on the day when LeBron James came down. The Lakers were playing against the Nets, Brooklyn Nets, that's what they call them, right? The lecture was after Isha. Right? I walked past the Barclay Center at Maghrib time. And they were lining up at the Barclay Center to watch the basketball game. While the Muslims packed up the masjid an hour and a half before the lecture. Look at the contrast of that brother and sister. That really, really touched my heart, man. It really did. Right? Anyways, playing basketball, guys, is it haram? Playing football, I mean soccer. Soccer. Yeah? Yeah? You guys all talk about something else. Is it haram? No. Unless of course it involves haram. But the asal of doing sports and exercising is not haram. Sahih? What if you're now doing it so excessively that it ends up affecting your prayers and your ibadah? Does it become haram? So what if it's not? But you're spending so much time of your day doing it. The time of the salah kicks in, you pray. But you're spending maybe seven, eight hours a day playing hoops. Is it harmless? Nice? Hmm? 
Imagine now, my brothers and my sisters, doing something that is permissible excessively. Ibn al-Jawzi is saying this is going to cause you hardness in your, in your heart. It's going to cause it to become dark. Right? Reading the newspaper, my brothers and my sisters, is a haram. Going on to... I was going to say Fox News, but forget about that. Huh? Like reading the Washington Post. Which one's more worse? This one or that one? Or whatever news tabloid you guys have that is okay huh? in its content. Is it haram? But you're spending the whole day scrolling through the... Huh? These articles. He says, إِذَا غَرِقَ الْقَلْبُ فِي الْمُبَاحِ أَضْرًا If your heart now, my brothers and my sisters, begins to drown in that which is permissible, it starts becoming dark. فَكَيْفَ بِالْحَرَامِ Then how about if you're doing haram, brothers and sisters? What that's going to end up doing to your heart? To conclude, my brothers and my sisters, five points that I want you guys to act upon. Five points. Inshallah ta'ala, if you stick to these five points, you will remain steadfast. Number one, guys. These are practical steps that I want you guys to take away. Some of you guys may have heard certain clips going around when me speaking about these five things. They are essential to every single Muslim. Especially if you're a youngster living in this dar of fitna. What's number one, guys? Huh? Who said that? Number one guys is Salah. I don't care what's happening in your life, brothers and sisters. Don't leave off the Salah. If you are the biggest drug dealer in Ohio, if you're here, welcome to the message, Shake. Huh? If you are the biggest drug dealer in Ohio, Columbus, don't leave off the Salah. The shaitan sometimes will whisper, how can you be drug dealing and you also what? Praying at the same time. That is a trap of the shaitan. Likewise, if you are a sister who is selling herself or doing whatever, posting huh, on the world wide web, getting money out of that, then you guys know what I'm talking about. Don't leave off the salah. Right. You know why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, Inna salata tanha and in fahshai wa nukha. The salat removes the filth and the evil from your life. I want to share with you guys something that Fusitub said. And excuse me for using him as an example. However, the fact that a lot of you guys know him, right, you may be able to relate. I have enough quotes from the Salaf. The righteous of the past, the three golden jets, the Sahaba, the Tabi'in, the Atbab and Tabi'in, who said this and who said that, but you're probably going to think, oh my life. Allah, Ya Hamu, may Allah have mercy upon him. May Allah be pleased with him. I can't relate. When in the 21st century, right? Be quiet. Did anybody see his interview just before his boxing match? He was being asked, how are you feeling? Guys, it's very, very important now, right? You might be able to take inspiration from it. Just before his boxing match, he's asked, how are you feeling? You know what he says? I left not drinking alcohol. I stopped consuming drugs. I stopped watching pornography. I stopped doing that stuff that men do to themselves. I don't do zina anymore. And I'm staying on top of my salah. And I could not feel any better. This is the same person who has announced his apostasy more than once. Isn't that so? Every now and again we see, I don't even watch these guys when he reaches me. I'm leaving Islam. I have bipolar. Someone who has, or will have previously, issues with his mental health. Right? But then now he's saying what? I'm staying on top of my salah and I could not feel any better and it's helping my mental health. It's first you guys. I've said it before and I'll say it again guys.
I had a good friend who was running the drug dealing industry. Have you guys heard it before? Uh, 